We've been talking a little bit about, or at least we did last week, Jesus kind of pointing us and the crowds that he's talking to to the future, uh, pointing us to the day you stand before God in heaven. And I said last week, we're going to come back to this a little bit this week as well, because it's kind of the same. Uh, But if you're living for this life and not for the next one, uh, he says, you don't have life in you. You're, you're missing out if you're just doing things for this life and this life only. And so thanks, Scott, for choosing that. Thanks, band, for sounding wonderful. If As we start getting back into um, normal kind of worship band teams where we have a, a few more than just the five people that we have spread way out, uh, and you want to be a part of what Scott's doing, what the band's doing, what musically we're doing here, would you please call in and talk to Scott, okay? If you're watching and you're like, I'd like to be a part of all that when all this mess is over, would you please contact him? Because he's always looking for people to train, help get better, give opportunities. Uh, the band's always looking for new people. So just FYI, as we come back from all of this stuff, if you're interested in being a part of that, please, please contact Scott. We're in John chapter 6. And we got this week and one more week of John chapter 6, and then we'll go on to John chapter 7. Uh, but a couple of more things we need to figure out from John chapter 6 before we go. Uh, recap, recap just briefly. We won't go over all of it again because we've been in John chapter 6 for a while now. This is John chapter 6, verse 51. Jesus says this to the crowds in Capernaum. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So the crowds come to Jesus saying, What sign do you show us that you're authoritative, that you're speaking from God? And he says, I am the bread of life. It's a response that he gives to them. Then go down a few more verses, 58, 59. We read these last week. He says, This is the bread of life that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever, Jesus said these things, in the synagogue at Capernaum. So he's in Capernaum, which is northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, for those of you who are familiar with that. And there's a crowd there, and he's trying to get them to understand that he's the greater Moses. He's trying to get them to understand that he's the one that God sent from heaven. He's trying to get them to, last week we talked about, eat his flesh and drink his blood, uh, which if you missed it last week, or if you're anything like the crowds, you missed the analogy, which is to believe, to believe in Jesus so that you can have eternal life. It's what he's trying to get them to understand. Now, if you've been, if while we've been going through all this stuff, you've been thinking to yourself, this is strange. Uh, I don't want to eat anybody's flesh. I definitely don't want to drink anybody's blood. Uh, And What's all this talk about Moses and manna and bread and eternal life? If you're at all sitting there going, this is strange or this is weird or I don't really understand it, you're not alone. (laughs) You're right there with the crowds for sure. And you're even right there on the same lines as the disciples because they at this point are still like, what is going on? What is happening? So if you're any... If that's what you've been thinking as we've been going through John chapter 6, or if you just read John chapter 6 on your own and you're like, this doesn't make any sense at all, you'd be a whole lot like the crowds. Listen to, this is starting in verse 60. This is where we left off last week. John chapter 6 verse 60 says, When many of his disciples heard it, all this stuff that he's saying, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? In other words, they're sitting there going, I don't know. Like, maybe... Maybe he's crazy. I mean, maybe, maybe he's off his rocker. Uh, this is strange. Like, we were okay with Jesus doing miracles. We might have been okay with him walking on the water. If he heals people, that's great. Feeds us even better. But now he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And he's talking about coming down from heaven. And we know that he's a man, but how could he have come down from heaven if he's a man? And so they're somewhat putting the pieces together, at least to the point where they're saying to themselves, this is, this is tough. Uh, we're not really sure what to even do with this. So if you're there, welcome to the club. Uh, if you're like the rest of the world, that is like, we don't know what to G- do with Jesus because what Jesus teaches is tough. 
you're right, right on. Uh, difficult to understand that Jesus is the true bread that came down from heaven. Difficult to understand that we have to believe in him. Difficult to understand that he's the only one that offers eternal life. It's okay for you to be difficult. Uh, not for you to be difficult. You should not be difficult. It's okay for that to be difficult for you to understand. Uh, Jesus knew these things. He knew he would say it to the crowds. He knew that it would be difficult for them to understand. So then these last few verses of, of this chapter, they're really going to hit the punchline. Jesus is now presented that he's the greater Moses. He's presented himself in godlike fashion. He's presented himself as the sacrifice the way to eternal life. And now kind of comes the breaking moment. Do you accept all of it and believe, or do you not and walk away? And that's kind of where we're at here at the end of John chapter 6. So this is the, the question then that Jesus poses to the disciples who are like, I'm not quite sure what to do with this. I don't know if I want to believe this is all kind of strange. Jesus asked this, verse 61. Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, do you take offense at this? Some translation, are you offended by this? Other translations, does this cause you to stumble? The, I don't give you Greek very often, but I'll give it to you here because I think it'll help you understand. The, the Greek word here for to take offense or to be offended by something is skandalizo which you could hear the English word scandalous. It has the definition causing the general public outraged by perceived offense against morality. So Jesus is coming saying that God that you thought in the Old Testament or the Moses that you thought you would follow, um, it's me. <laughs> you should be following me. And also I am God. And then he asks them this question, does that offend you? Does that cause you outrage, essentially? There's more meaning to it than just scandalous in the Greek. There's more meaning to it than just offense. Um, this is essentially Jesus asking them, is this information going to cause you to no longer believe? So the way this word is used here, what he's really asking them is, you've heard the whole story now. You've heard and you've seen the miracles that exemplify me as the greater Moses. You've heard me say that I'm the bread of life. You've heard me say that you don't get eternal life unless you eat of me. You've heard me say that I'm, I have come down from heaven, which means he is God. Does all these things that I'm telling you now cause you to stop believing? And it's the question that he's asking the crowds. It's the question that he's asking his disciples. Do you take offense at this? In case they were like, yes, <laughs> I totally take offense at this. This is ridiculous. Uh, I don't want to believe this um, because it's just, it's, it doesn't make any sense. I, I can't put all the pieces together in my mind. He gives them something to hold on to, but it's something to hold on to that's going to happen in the future. When he says it to them here, they're, they don't really have a clue what he's talking about. But he's preparing them for his death, his resurrection, his ascension in the future, so that even if they don't get it now, when he dies, resurrects, and ascends to heaven, they go, oh, that's what he was talking about. It's verse 62. Jesus says, do you take offense at this first? And then he says this, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? He's prepping them for Acts chapter 2 when the disciples are standing and they're watching him ascend to heaven to the right hand of God. I am the bread of life. Believe in me to get eternal life. We're not really sure what to do with that. What if you saw me ascend to the right hand of God? Now, there, I'm sure, doesn't give their response. I'm sure some of them were like, yeah, I mean, if you would just do that, that would be great. And he's got to go through death and resurrection first. But then once they see that, they can think back to this moment. Uh, well, Jesus said he was going to do this. And if he actually ascended to the right hand of the Father, like Acts chapter 2 says, then that also proves that he descended from heaven. Because if you go back to John chapter 3, he says this to Nicodemus. No one has ascended 
to heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So as soon as they see the resurrection, or as soon as they see the ascension, they're going to see him go up, and then they're going to think back to this conversation with Nicodemus and say, if he went up, he must have been the one that came down, and if he came down, then everything he said in John chapter 6 is also true. That he is the bread of life, that he is the greater Moses, these things are all connected. Jesus is putting the pieces together for them, but up to this point, they don't understand it. But you and I should understand it. This is the beauty of having this whole book finished, and we're not walking with Jesus and trying to figure out what is he talking about. We have the story of the ascension. We have his conversation with Nicodemus. We have his conversation here with the crowds. And we can walk through and put all the pieces together that it all fits. He's consistent in what he's saying. And uh, maybe you might come to the conclusion that he's not crazy. Verse 63 is where we're going to kind of camp out a little bit today. And you'll see why as we go. Verse 63, Jesus says this to the crowds. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The question that he just asked the crowds is essentially, do you believe it? Or do all these things that I'm saying to you, do they cause you not to believe? Do they cause you to walk away and say, that guy's crazy? The key to this, then, he says, is it is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. Since I already referenced John chapter 3, and Jesus in discussion with Nicodemus, I'm going to go back to John chapter 3 again, this time to John chapter 3, verse 6, since it's kind of already in the background. Jesus says this to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's saying the same thing to the crowds here. You can try and try and try and try all you want in the flesh to be saved, to believe, to be good enough, to enter the presence of God, but... The reality is, is if you work in the flesh, the only thing that will get you is the benefits of the flesh. Or you could work in the spirit, and that will bring you something very, very different. Essentially, literal translation of the flesh is no help at all. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh profits nothing if God is not also at work. And this is why I said this week is kind of like last week. Uh, Last week, we talked about um, Jesus saying that you have no life in you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have no life in you in John 6, 53. And I said last week that there's a lot of people that they feel like they're alive. They live, they have a family, they have a job, they go to work, they come home, they work on their house, or they watch a whole lot of Netflix. And they're like, I live. I, I mean, I live. So how can you tell me that I'm not alive? And we, and we talked about last week how Jesus was essentially saying to the crowds, yeah, you can live now. But when you die and you stand before God, there will be a whole lot of eternity after now. And you could be alive, meaning the God-given breath in your lungs and blood in your veins, but you're not really alive to living in relationship with God the way it was always supposed to be. Same thing is happening here. The flesh profits nothing. And you can say, wait, 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 wait. I I can go in my backyard and I can build something. Or I can go in my house and I I can use my hands and I can build something. and, And then I have it. And I used my flesh to do it. And I built it and it was good. Or you can say, I use my flesh every day and I make money. Or I use my flesh and I make babies. I mean, you, you, could say, you could say, I use my flesh for a lot of things, and I, and I gain a lot of things. You could gain knowledge, you could give knowledge. So how is it then that Jesus can say, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all? The reason why I point out the baby's one is because that's the one where I'm thinking, no, I literally gave life. Like, how, 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 how is it that you could say that I can't give life just by fleshly means? It's the same story that God is trying to get us to understand last week in just living in general. Picture it like this. 
you build a bunch of things in life. You build an empire. You have a business that's multi-millions of dollars, and you employ hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, and you build this empire of a business while you live. Then you die, and you go to heaven, and you say, God, I built this empire of a business. And it, and it employs thousands of people. And you're standing in front of a God pleading your case who has been building empires and employing thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands and millions of people for all of eternity. And you think that you're going to stand in front of God and say, look, I built this empire. Isn't it so great? And he's going to be impressed by that? You could, you, could, you, could, you could earn seven PhDs. Be one of the most well-educated, world-renowned for your field. You could go on tours and teach everybody what you know that no one else knows. And you could die and say, God, I, I built up this, this knowledge base, this intelligence, and, and I'm just so smart, you should let me in. And you're going to be standing before a God who created everything? Who's, who's, who's probably going to say to you, did you figure out how to create something from nothing yet? You could have worked in the same profession for 60 years. You are the expert. You, you have studied every aspect of it. You know the ins and outs of how this business works. And you get to heaven and you're like, I, I am an expert. I, I lived my life well. I grew in knowledge. I gained understanding. I became the best at my field. <laughs> to stand in front of God and have him say to you, the 50 years that you have had, I have had thousands of years of experience and expertise. When I was going through this text, um, for those of you who are like Netflix buffs right now, uh, or you're watching a bunch of old movies because you're done with the new stuff and you've got to go back and watch the old stuff, which is what I was doing a couple of weeks ago, um, I was watching a movie, I was watching a Batman movie, I was watching The Dark Knight, and it, when I was then reading this text, I was thinking, it's just like Batman. Uh, so let me explain a little bit. Uh, there's a scene in the Batman movie, The Dark Knight, where there's an accountant. And the accountant works for Wayne Enterprise, and he was told to crunch some numbers for the organization in this department over here. And so he goes over and he starts crunching some numbers, and he starts digging in some other areas of the company and stumbles across applied sciences and figures out that applied sciences just disappeared overnight. Like, what happened to applied sciences? So he goes and starts doing more digging, and uh, he ends up coming to the, the person running Wayne Enterprise. For those of you who are not familiar with Batman, Bruce Wayne is Batman, and he owns Wayne Enterprise. And there's a guy running Wayne Enterprise at this point, which, whose name is Lucius. He's played by uh, Morgan Freeman. And this accountant comes to Lucius and he says this. He goes, I did some digging and I found out this about applied sciences. And then I looked into the technology that you guys were developing. And uh, I figured out that essentially he finds evidence that they're supplying Batman with uh, all of his techie toys. And this accountant guy leans back in his chair and he says, I want $10 million dollars every year for the rest of my life to keep my mouth shut. And Lucius, he's running Wayne Enterprises at the time. He leans forward in his chair, takes off his glasses. He says this to the accountant. Let me get this straight. You think that your client, one of the wealthiest, most powerful men in the world, is secretly a vigilante 
that spends his nights beating criminals to a pulp with his bare hands, and your plan is to blackmail this person? And he sits back in his chair and he puts his glasses back on and he says, good luck. If you think that you are going to work in the flesh on this earth and work and work and work until your hands bleed and gain all kinds of knowledge and you're going to get to heaven and you're going to say, God, look at me. I'm so good. I did so much great things. Good luck. It just doesn't make any sense. We have to come to Jesus. We have to come to God with, <laughs> with a certain humility to understand that this is creator God that you're going to stand in front of, that this is thousands of years of experience, that this is expertise beyond belief, that this is intellect and knowledge that you could never attain. This is the leader of the heavenly host, armies upon armies. You cannot fight your way into heaven. This is the guy who knows your every thought. This is the perfect judge. It's the one you're going to stand before. And when you stand before him, this will be true. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is no help at all. In case you're a little bit confused at how Jesus is telling you and I that we should get the Spirit and use that when we stand before God. He qualifies in the next half of this verse. So second half of verse 63. Jesus says, The words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and they are life. The Spirit is what you need when you stand before God, your flesh will profit you nothing. And the spirit that you need is my words, which he's just said that he's the bread of life. That you don't get to eternal life except through him. He's just repeating himself, but giving you an eternal perspective on why you should believe what he's saying. For those of you who are Old Testament buffs and who are understanding that Jesus is again and again and again and again, setting himself up to be the greater Moses. Don't miss this reference to Jesus being the bread of life. I haven't brought this up yet, but it's in the background of all these texts. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. This is the writings of Moses. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. <laughs> you see Jesus putting the pieces together. He's feeding people in the wilderness. He's showing up like Moses. He's speaking words of life to them, telling them exactly what they need to know. I'm the bread of life. You have to believe in me to get eternal life. Your flesh profits nothing. You can't do it on your own. And then he's saying to them, Moses fed you manna in the wilderness so that you would know that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then Jesus says it here. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Put the pieces together. I've been saying it. This is thousands of years of salvation history. It all goes together. If you want life, stick to this book. Believe it. Understand it. There's a teenager who told me that during quarantine, she read the whole Bible in 31 days. I can't even read the whole Bible in a year. I get stuck in Isaiah or the Psalms. 31 days. Making the most of quarantine. I don't say that to say to you that you should be reading your Bible eight hours a day. Uh, quarantine teenagers is a little bit different than uh, quarantine full-time workers who still have a job. What I'm saying to you is this. It didn't solve all of her problems. It didn't make all of her anxieties go away. But it did establish a pattern of feeding on God. 
the feeding on his words because his words are spirit. His words are life. Here's the reality, though. The reality is, is that there is a choice. And no matter what I tell you about what you're going to experience after you die or what you think about who God is or any of that, the reality is, is it is a choice to believe what Jesus said or not. Jesus said this in verse 64. There are some of you who do not believe. We're going to talk more about the reality that some people just don't believe. You could have Jesus standing in front of them, feeding them food that was multiplied miraculously. You could have him walking on water, him standing in front of them, telling them exactly what truth is, and the reality is is some people will just not believe. And we're talking more about that next week because you'll actually get to see it with the crowds. So for now, we'll just keep moving. But I want to skip the next verse here because it's a, it's a parenthesis. It's an added statement by John. So I want to keep going to what Jesus said from verse 64 to verse 65, the first half of 64, and then straight on to 65. We'll come back to what John said in like two minutes here. So Jesus said this, but there are some of you who do not believe, and then down to verse 65, He said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And I've said, we've touched on this already twice in this chapter. Started in verse 37. Jesus said, all the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And then verse 44, he says it again. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And then here... Again in verse 65. But this time, he says this. This is the reason why I told you no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Directly after saying, some of you won't believe. Some of you don't believe. This is why I said to you, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. The question has always been in these verses, what is Jesus saying and why is he saying it? He's trying to get across to the crowds that you cannot do anything apart from the work of God. And in this case, not even believing. He's talking about belief and people who choose not to believe. And he's been saying again and again and again, the reason why I'm telling you this, that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him, is because the reality is some people will choose not to believe. It's the same reason why I've been praying for the last three weeks, God, help us believe, help us believe, help us believe. Uh, It should be the prayer of every husband or wife that has a spouse that's unbelieving. God, help them believe. They cannot do it on their own. It it should be the prayer, and I didn't realize this until I was going over this last week, but it, it should be the prayer of every parent. God, help them believe. There are some of you who do not believe. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father is granted him. Of praying for your children and for your spouse and for people that you need to believe. God, help them believe. They cannot do it on their own. He's trying to ultimately prepare the crowds, the disciples, that you cannot understand Salvation, you, you cannot achieve salvation, you can never have enough knowledge, you can't force God, you can't manipulate Him, you can't be good enough to wiggle your way into heaven. It has to be a work of God in you, and you have to choose it. And if you haven't got there yet, you can keep praying, God, help me believe. Because the flesh profits nothing if God's not also at work. And then go back to the parentheses from verse 64. This is John's commentary. He's writing this gospel after Jesus has already ascended. And he's going back and he's remembering this story and he's inputting his commentary in verse 64. So Jesus is speaking real time. Then in between 64 and 65, John's coming in and he's implanting some interpretation to help you and I understand what Jesus is doing. He's trying to get them to understand that you can't do anything apart from the work of God but he's also preparing them for the betrayal of Judas. 
So the parentheses in verse 64. For Jesus knew from the beginning who it was who would not believe or did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Now that is a clear reference to Judas later on in the Gospels who turns Jesus over, who then he's crucified, died, buried, resurrected, sets on that chain of events. John is saying that Jesus is preparing them to make sense of all that. Maybe, maybe you have a hard time understanding why that would be necessary. There are some disciples, and they're walking with Jesus, and they believe, and they're following him. You ever known somebody uh, that you meet them, and you find out they're a Christian, or you meet them at church, and you, you kind of look up to their faith, and you think, wow, this, this person believes, and this person is walking it out, and they're doing great. And you walk with them for a while, and then 10 years later, or 15 years later, or whatever, they fall off the deep end. They're not chasing after Christ. They don't want anything to do with God or the church. And then all of a sudden, God doesn't exist, or they never believed in the first place. Or, And you're kind of going, wait. We were in the same place, hearing the same things, growing the same way. I, I used to look up to this person. How is it now that they could just walk away? And that's essentially what's going to happen with Judas. He's walking with the disciples. He's there with Jesus. He's experiencing the miracles. He's seeing all the same things. Then he's going to go and betray him. And there's going to be a moment in the disciples' life where they're going, wait, what happened? How? How did we end up here and Judas end up there? Jesus is trying to get them to understand that even the work of salvation, even the work of belief is twofold. It's two-sided. There is the work of God and there is also our choice. John's commentary is trying to get us to understand that Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples for Judas' betrayal. What do I do with it? How do I understand it? How does it make sense to me? The flesh profits nothing if God is not also at work. If you're not believing or you have never believed in Jesus, I hope that this makes sense to you, uh, that you have a decision to make, that you could choose to believe or you could choose to walk away. That's your choice. And if you're struggling to believe or you don't know how, the prayer is simple. God, help me believe. Uh, it has to be your help because I can't do it on my own. If you're a believer and you're thinking, all this stuff has to do with uh, someone who's not a believer coming to faith, so what the heck does that have to do uh, with me? I, I would point you, and I've been saying this again and again and again as we've been talking about belief. The initial belief is called salvation, justification, some people might call it. That's the initial belief. But the subsequent moments of belief after that is called perseverance. It's the continual belief day after day until the day that you die or Jesus comes back. But I'd also point you to, to Galatians chapter 3. This is, this is maybe for me the most convicting verse I've ever read. Uh, and I will never share it as my favorite verse because it's one of my least favorite verses. It seems like no matter when I read it, uh, it is always convicting. This is Galatians chapter 3 verse 3. Paul writes this to the Galatian church. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? It takes the Spirit of God to help you believe. But in the process of sanctification, as we go and we live as believers, as Christians, if we try to walk and be changed by our own flesh, if we try to build our own empires on our own, if we try to satisfy God on our own, after we knew that we needed the help of God to believe, we're wasting our time. Paul would call us fools. To believe with the help of God and then to go on living without the help of God, that's foolishness. So I would encourage you that... If you're understanding that the flesh was no help to you when you came to God and said, God, save me, that you should continue to understand that the flesh will not help you as you continue to follow after God. 
Believe because the Spirit convicted you, and then be perfected because the Spirit is perfecting you. One of the ways you might be able to do that is to look for where God is working. Roger said this in a staff meeting the other day, and then we'll be done here. He said to the staff, in trying to encourage us to figure out how do we deal with uh, coronavirus stuff, how do we do ministry, it's changing so fast, and all this stuff, and, and he simply said this to us, and it's wisdom that I'm passing on to you. He said this, wherever you see God working, go there and join in. If it's true that the flesh profits nothing outside of the work of God, if God is not in it, you can try and try and try and try as you want in your flesh, and it will not get you what you want. If it's true that the flesh profits nothing, if God is not also at work, then the goal should be find out where God is working, go there and work there with him. It's simple truth, and yet sometimes... Hard to understand. Pray with me. God, thanks that we can even believe because you enable us. God, thanks that you have, for hopefully everybody here in this room today, um, enabled us to have faith. God, I pray that you would continually perfect us by your Spirit day after day so that we don't find ourselves one day in unbelief. God, for people who have never made that choice before, God, would you move in their life? Help them to believe. And God, for the ones of us who have come to the realization that we can't save ourselves, we need you and we need you to move, would you not let us become fools having believed in you by your Spirit and then going on living our life in our flesh? God, would you continually fill us with your spirit? God, would you make us good surrenderers to what you're doing in our life? God, help open our eyes to what's going on around us. We want to do what you're doing. We want to be a part of what you're doing. God, so just show it to us and help us not to be conceited or hard-hearted or hard-headed. Help us just to continually submit the same way we did when we first believed. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.